and I am a student there, and I am also the part of the Sonochemist Research Group at the Department of Hydrodynamic Systems. And Dr. Ferenc Hegedish is the leader of this research group and also the co-author of this work. And today, I'm going to talk about uh, the acceleration of the solution of a large number of differential equations using GPUs. First, I would like to start with something interesting. By that, I mean some applications of delay differential equations. Um, in that case, uh, the recovery time of a disease and the incubation time of a disease can be included in the differential equations as a delay. A practical example is that would be the forecast would be the forecasting of the spread of a virus. A very different application is in the com computer control of systems. Uh, producing the output of a digital controller can require a lot of uh, computational time. And this computational time can affect the dynamic behavior of the system because it causes a delay. Help us to avoid this kind of stability loss. A very similar um, application is in human balancing. But the main motivation of my work is the potential application in some chemistry. The goal of sonochemistry is to increase the yield of chemical processes with ultrasound. Here, the wave propagation velocity is finite. And in very simple models, we model it as a delay between objects. <clears throat> all those uh, equations that, yeah, so they are all low order equations. For example, in epidemic models, they usually use third order differential equations. In sonochemistry, we use second order differential equations. And usually those equations have several parameters. And sometimes we are not sure about those parameters, which means that, or we want to optimize those parameters, which usually means that we have to solve a lot of the same differential equation. And we apply GPUs for that to accelerate the solution of a large number of differential equations. So the derivative x dot does not only depend on the state x, but also it depends on previous states. And this form actually describes the system of uh, equations with m variables. And the x is the vector of the dependent variables, and those tau are the delays. And depending on the application, we buy and the peculiarity of those differential equations that instead of initial conditions, we have to specify a whole initial function because of the delays. We, we must know the past. And in theory, uh, those delays can be uh, can depend on the state of the system. But in practice, those kind of equations are extremely rare. And from the implementation point of view, it's much easier to um, to assume that those delays are constant and it's also true in most case so in the in my presentation i'm only discussing mass so to solve a um, delay differential equation efficiently we should choose a runge kutta method and if we choose a piece order runge kutta method then a p minus one order interpolation method must be used so that we won't lose the on order of convergence and also because of the delay, um, we must know the past values. And for that, it's not enough to save every value. We must interpolate between those values. And for that, we should choose an interpolation method which doesn't the endpoints of the steps and the derivatives in those points. And the other option is using uh, a continuous extension of uh, runge kutta method which basically reuses the stages of the runge kutta method to produce um, an interpolation. So for an efficient, um, yeah, so solving delay differential equations on GPUs is, requires some extra care compared to solving ordinary differential equations. But it makes sense to try the efficient ODE methods. 
it was found uh, by us earlier that uh, the parcel approach for ODs is very efficient. We could reach um, in that publication 80% flow efficiency. This means that this parcel approach has different parameters, and that's the only difference between the threads that they solve OD with different parameters. And of course, each thread uses the Runge-Kutta method, and they have the same fixed time step. From the implementation point of view, this and there is also no communication between the threads. This makes the code both very easy to implement and fast. Well, the only problem with this approach is with branches. So, for example, on if else statements can cause thread divergence. And but branches are necessary, for example, in a case of an adaptive solver, or if you want to do event 10. Our thread approach, which is using the GPU for vector and matrix operations, and basically solving a large system of equations and carrying out the necessary uh, vector and matrix operations on the GPU. Well, it's all nice so far, but did this require interpolation, as I said earlier? And this means two things. First, data must be written to the global memory after each step, because the actual state global memory before each step to calculate the necessary uh, values uh, using the interpolation. But if we want to save everything, that requires the allocation of a lot of global memory. Let's say we want to solve 10,000 first order DDs and each with 10,000 time steps. While well, allocating memory for that would require one and a half gigabyte global memory. You mean global memory on the GPU? Yes, on the GPU, yes. Or even longer time domains. So usually the global memory is not enough. Uh, our solution to this problem was implementing a circular memory pattern because we have finite delays and we can actually predict that how many uh, memory, how much memory we need to have all the necessary data in the memory. So we are implementing a fixed size circular memory, which means that if we, if, uh, we overwrite the values, which we won't be, we won't need anymore. GPUs. I implemented mm -hmm. it, in, it in the ambiguous package, which is developed on our department. And uh, originally it was for the solution. Uh, for delay differential equations. And this, this is a general purpose delay differential equation solver for GPUs, which means that an arbitrary number of dependent variables or arbitrary number of constant delays and parameters can be specified. And I implemented it using C++ for GPUs. And I used the traditional fourth order actresses from Gekuto method and for that, I use the third order Hermit interpolation to calculate the fast values uh, up to a third order precision. Okay, and uh, the main steps of my algorithm is seen here. The first step is the initialization on the CPU. Then the blocks inside the red rectangle are run on the GPU. So the initialization consists of the setup of the time domain and the time step and the delays and the initial functions are also set up here. Then the global memory is filled up on the GPU. Um, it is important that we only need dense output to the variables, which has a delay. And by that dense, by the dense output, I mean that uh, if a variable has a dense output, then we can calculate this uh, variable's value at any previous time step up to a, uh, a third order precision. And here this uh, circular memory is initialized using the initial function. And for that, uh, the initial function must be discretized. And by discretizing the initial function, we get the nice and homogeneous code and we can as we use later. 
and then the iteration starts. And in each iteration, this time step is calculated. Well, this time step is a constant, but later, if we want to implement um, uh, event handling or an adaptive solver, this, this might change. But those are not implemented yet, but later they might be. Uh, and the next step is calling the stepper function. And this is basically just the implementation of the axis force ordering of the method. So we calculate the four stages with green, and we must uh, read the past values here in those um, red blocks. Those are basically called a calculate past values function. And this actually does the interpolation and the memory read. Because we must use this time step later for to calculate previous values. Um, so has a dense output so that we can save some memory usage. And also at the end of the time step, a user defined function is called. And this user defined function can do easy. Easy things like finding a minimum or a maximum during the process, and the whole memory was in, um, was implemented so that the memory access is aligned and coalesced. So it's it will be useful. So it will be efficient on the GPU. And uh, then at the end of the time step, uh, we check if the Next, I tested the performance of my code. And to test the performance of our general solver, this Ampigos, I compared it to several different solvers. I code, and those, um, those problem-specific codes <laughs> harness the maximal possible uh, performance that we could reach. But they, they are not general, so basically, And I also tested one commercial solver for CPU. This is in the Julia language, it's the differential equations package. And for the test, I used an NVIDIA GTX Titan Black GPU with 1.8 teraflops theoretical performance. And for the CPU, I just used my own laptop. But uh, what is important that its performance is roughly one fiftieth of the GPU. And to compare them, each code should carry out the same task so that they can be compared. For that, I created two test problems. First is the delay logistic equation. This is a very simple first order delay differential equation with one single delay here. And this also has a parameter. And basically the task is to run this delay logistic equation with different number of p parameters. And then p denotes the number of different parameters we have. And for each parameter, I do 10,000 time steps. And I similar test problem for the delayed Lorentz equation. The only difference is that it is a third order equation. The exact form is not um, really interesting now. Okay, so the runtime of the logistic equation is plotted here versus the number of parameters. As we should expect, the fastest code is the specific GPU code here with red. And the CPU and the, gen and the specific CPU code is, is, of course, faster than this commercial solver for CPUs. Mm. And what is interesting here that for a low number of parameters, by that I mean around a few thousand, the changing the number of parameters doesn't really affect the runtime on, G, on the GPUs. That's because here we don't reach the ideal occupancy of the GPU. 
And I also provide my codes using the MVPro profiler in the case where I, I run the simulation. For the specific GPU codes, the fastest uh, configuration was to call the kernel 32 times and each fit uh, about 8,000 steps for them because it was a little different. Mm. And we can see that um, the memory uh, implementation is very efficient. But we can also see that the MPGOS is much slower than the specific GPU code. All details. Uh, but then the flow efficiency of this is quite low. I did a similar test for the Lorentz equation. Here we can also see that the five or six times slower is the ambiguous, which is the general solver. And here I would like to mention that it only works to use GPUs for the solution of low order or differential equations or delayed differential equations if the number of equations to solve is very large. So here we can see that the runtime is, is still quite low, but if you would solve like 100 or 1 billion delayed differential equations, then this five or six times difference would be actually very meaningful. And I provide the codes again. Here I reached a better. We don't need to use that much memory operations for the, uh, for the interpolation. And there are more arithmetic operations in the system. To summarize everything, uh, to summarize the test, we have, um, we have seen that the specific GPU codes are run 30 times faster uh, than the CPU solvers, and the difference in the capacity of the CPU and the GPU is around 50 times. And MPGOS was much, much faster than the fastest commercial CPU solver, of course, but MPGOS is not the ideal yet. The flow efficiency and the speed could be increased. And of course, larger system has better performance because it requires more arithmetic operations. In the future, I plan to improve the performance and add adaptive uh, and add event handling in the in the solver. And also, I'm um, and I would like to try I try to implement adaptive methods. Well, the problem with adaptive methods is that there the parser approach doesn't work. There it were to try an uh, heterogeneous CPU GPU solver, but I wouldn't like to talk much more about this. So in my presentation, I talked about how to what mathematical tools we need for an efficient solution for a delay differential equations. I presented my own algorithm. Then I ran my algorithm, I implemented my algorithm in a general server and also for problem specific cases and I compared the runtimes and I also uh, measured the metrics of my codes. I used and uh, also the solvers are available on the GitHub. Thank you very much. Uh, questions? Oh, Sorry, question. Please. So, is the only key difference between the generic and the specific GPU solver the memory layout, or there's more in the background that goes to? Um, yes. Yeah, so for the specific solver, I didn't implement the circular memory because those were kind of small problems, and we didn't need that. And that might be a large difference. Yeah, that's one. And of course, for the general servers, we have. So the general servers work for any number of dependent variables, and and in the specific so it was hard coded that the number of dependent variables is one. So uh, it gives the compiler more of option to optimize the code. Can you give some examples? Yeah, yeah. Well, Sonocomitry is uh, not used in the industry yet. It's a, it's a plan for the future to basically it allows us to create some materials more efficiently than with regular uh, chemical processes, just with the use of ultrasound. And this works because uh, in a fluid, there are several small bubbles. 
and those bubbles oscillate and those bubble oscillations can can um thousands of kelvin and this can induce chemical reactions so that's the point and this works in the laboratory but it doesn't work in practice yet or it's not used in practice yet and there those and there those bubbles are modeled with ordinary differential equations but there are like millions of bubbles and and those bubbles of course if about the yield of a process we might we should simulate it of course and this requires the solution of a large system of delay differential equations for example uh, one more thing uh, when you compare the specific cpu and gpu what was the memory for the certain cases the memory the memory of the system so was it the same or it's the same yes i run them on the same system but uh, when you use the specific See, I'll go to the maybe this one. No, 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 this, this one. one. Oh. Specific CPU and the GPU. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, maybe this yes, yes. Okay. Um, so for the specific CPU code, I just wrote it on one uh, thread on the I CPU. Yes. Okay. So of course it has. So then, so it's it's. It's much more efficient, of course, because the CPU has better functional logic and everything. On the CPU, because for example, for the GPU codes, mm -hmm. we need like 80 or 100 registers per thread. So there is a some registers fill also. And in CPU, it's not a problem because we are solving one equation. So. Oh, okay, it's very nice. And congratulations on this night. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, before the, the break, Kari Chitoshi makes a decision when it uh, when is it worth it. So hello everyone. Yeah. Uh, hello everyone. I'm Manny Chikros, a PhD student at Franklin Peter Catholic University. And in the next few minutes, I would like to work around a little bit about um, mixed precision computing. First of all, I will try to define what is mixed precision computing with some additional notes that why it is really um, a per, um, useful tool, uh, why is it a hot topic today. Um, then I will give you some examples. So many scientific, well, most of the scientific applications are using the IEEE 754 um, representation for floating point numbers. Um, this, um, um, this gives us several different sizes. Um, the 64 bit wide level precision, 32 bit wide single, um, 16 bit wide half precision. All of them are coming with their own parameters. Um, different dynamic range ranges and um, their own precisions. Um, if we have an application defined in double precision, uh, but we modify, change everything to single precision, it is really uh, clear to see that uh, that we will have and so on, but our final result might be invalid or a little bit wrong. So, thank you. Um, so we we have to think about that how much we we can lower the precision of the algorithm. We have to find the perfect ratio. We cast one part of our application from higher. Uh, precision to, to lower precision. 
But another problem here is that uh, during the runtime, there might be a lot of uh, conversion. conversion. That is another problem that we have to think about. Of course, there are some other uh, representations which, um, which can help on this. For example, the TensorFlow 32 from NVIDIA and Bplot 16 from Google. Uh, the, um, all of, uh, both of these representations have the same dynamic range like the uh, FP32 but with smaller precision. So overall, we have smaller numbers uh, in the representation. These handle these are uh, much quicker. they collected the most important uh, challenges that we have to face if we uh, want to get to the exascale computing. The first big challenge was the power consumption and the technology at that time to have the one exascale uh, system, uh, it would consume 600 megawatts of power, which is not really acceptable. Uh, by today, we are uh, under the 20 megawatts, which is pretty fine, but that was one of the main big problems. Uh, second main problem is the speed and energy of the data movement. Uh, it took more time to move the data, move one piece of data than to execute the operations on it. So we have to work on that also. Uh, third is the fault tolerance. Uh, if we have way more uh, operations, failures can happen uh, much faster, much more frequently. Uh, checkpointing is still, uh, it was still uh, really slow. And the fourth one is the extreme parallelism. If we think about that, if we want to get to the which can uh, handle 1 billion uh, calculations every second. So these were the four uh, main challenges. And from these four, uh, three, three of these can be communications, the data size is much smaller. Uh, the memory wall is much smaller uh, with that. Um, we use less memory in the, uh, at all in the system. Um, if our numbers are represented in smaller sizes, then uh, the operations can go through quicker. We, have, we can have more flops per second uh, and so on. And also there are some specific we can have uh, a better performance. For example, in FPGs, uh, if we have the size of the numbers or the representation, then um, our performance speed up can be in, in the force, uh, for example, or in NVIDIA GPUs, we have these tensor cores, which are really effective tools for that. Uh, others already uh, recognize these, um, including two Gordon Bell Prize winners, uh, best paper at ISD 19. Um, at the end, you can check the references at the end of my slide, they will be updated. So, some examples. First one is just a really simple one. Let's imagine a Lagrangian uh, particle method problem. We have particles somewhere, uh, they have a position which can be basically anything. And that is pretty important. Let's keep it in 64 uh, bit uh, wide representation. But the movement, the displacements uh, will be probably a really small number. We don't need the dynamic range. Uh, Uh, and this way, a part of the application can be um, 
can run uh, before. Uh, let's get to a real problem, which is already measured. Uh, in machine learning, uh, at MWDM, they created a, um, a mixed precision training method. Uh, what they do is that they store the weights, the activations, and the gradients in uh, half precision. And, and in each iteration, and, and they uh, keep a, a master copy of the, of the weights in, in single precision. And uh, they calculate with the half precision ones, and uh, in each iteration, they do an update on can somewhat match the original um, half precision, uh, well, original single precision method. Uh, more details in, in their paper. The rule of thumb, uh, the relative residual accuracy uh, will be the production of the unit Randolph, the smallest uh, representable number in absolute value. Uh, with one um, represent Randolph and the linear systems condition number. If we apply them uh, in a conjugate gradient solver uh, in double precision, uh, with double precision, the unit Randolph will be 10 to the minus 16. So uh, after a lot of iteration, we can get a 10 to the 12 uh, accuracy uh, improvement. If we do the same application in single precision, uh, because of this rule of thumb, we will have about a 10, 10 to the cube um, improvement, which might be not enough for our application. But what we can is that if they redefine the problem at each level, uh, they can uh, again win. or for uh, accuracy, they redefined it again, and they received almost the same uh, final accuracy. And the end, we an improvement in this method. Another example we can see at the GPU mixer. Uh, what they do here uh, on a kernel level, um, they they introduce these so-called fast imprecise sets presets. They put one uh, operation into them, and they uh, compute the compute the dependencies from uh, everything outside of the presets uh, is in uh, double precision or in higher precision, and inside of presets. Uh, they um, cast everything to a smaller uh, or a lower precision. So they calculate that how many uh, data comes in, how many uh, uh, of, the, of this set, and they uh, compute that how many operations, arithmetic operations are inside uh, the set itself. Uh, in this case, we have three um, casting operations and one multiplication, uh, an arithmetic operation. We have a one to three ratio. Um, and they modify the kernel itself uh, when this ratio uh, is bigger than one uh, and they want to maximize it. So they extend, extend it, uh, but the algorithm extends the set with the neighboring um, operations. Again, they calculated operations this uh, way. In this case, we have uh, the two to three uh, ratio. And if we continue the algorithm at the end, we will have four operations inside, uh, arithmetic operations and only three casting operations. And this is bigger than one. So we can conclude that in this kernel, we can, uh, it might, it's it worth to um, 
cast this part into a lower precision. Uh, yeah, and this way, uh, some branch mark set. Um, here is an, uh, another input also, what they check uh, from the user that what precision uh, they want at the end. They do some, tri some trial tests for each kernel and check uh, whether the final result is still within the predefined error bounds. What, what we realized here uh, is that we can um, more mixed precision techniques if we know more about the uh, application itself uh, from the further view. To do that, we can use some domain specific abstractions. Um, through these, we can receive some further knowledge about the application. The idea here is and, uh, high performance computing, for example, or not efficiently, then he can declare the problem that he wants to con compute um, and uh, without specifying the, uh, the exact implement implementation. So, so just the physics and he can use some From that, we can uh, which can target different hardware or software platforms also. Um, and from this, from these um, domain specific constructs, we can uh, exploit some uh, further knowledge as well. Um, such a system is the OP2 domain specific library, which is developed for um, computational fluid dynamic codes and distributed memory clusters. It separates the high level description from the parallel implementation. It looks like a conventional library, but it uses code transformation. Here we can see an example. Um, if the user can define uh, firstly, um, the kernel function. And it is defined on an edge. And then later, the user calls an OP for loop function call. And here he defines that on what elements he wants to, um, want to run the application. Uh, this one. So it defines the kernel itself, some name, and uh, we have a set of elements where, um, where the user wants. And then we uh, list, or then the user lists some uh, other uh, arguments uh, how, about how can he reach the data or how can we reach the data. Um, and on this point, we uh, might find this further knowledge, or we can also read the kernel function. If we realize that if there is a function, for example, which um, uh, which increments uh, um, one uh, one variable each time and it is zeroed out, then we can we can we might say that. Uh, if we move it to a lower precision uh, at one point, then we will not really modify the this we can generate uh, mixed um, precisions. Uh, we tried this example just uh, on one simple CSD application called Airpoy, um, where we just for the first you realize that okay if uh, 
um, because it is just incrementing uh, one variable each time. Then uh, the output will be um, valid. And with that, we already uh, achieved a 10% speed up uh, easily on an Intel and then uh, on an NVIDIA stations as well. This research. Uh, there is a, still a lot of room where we can uh, go with this feeder. In theory, we can get to this part at the end. Uh, but uh, the question is that how can we automatize it? And uh, on our systems or on our applications. So, uh, I am open for questions, although there is a big chance that I cannot answer them because we are still at the really beginning. Comments or some additional thoughts that what should we think about what should be. Into cells, into sets, so you lower the precision, the process is faster. How do you recover so you know that the data at the end will have the uh, the required precision that you, that you want. Like, I don't, I don't know, like I, I know that it is separated in sets, so it, it lowers the precision, you can calculate it faster, but how do you have the, the last result so you know that it, it has the precision that you want? Mm -hmm. um, there is one thing that they've done in the GPU mixer uh, application, or a method that they done these trial runs. Uh, for each kernel, they tried it first, whether it will be we might do it this way. Uh, not sure yet. <laughs> okay. Uh, but like uh, I think that in the like going to this kind of envir big environmental models can be something to be which you can focus. Mm -hmm. Like for example, the one that you present at the beginning, like a uh, climate change, have a lot of uh, a lot of data that can be like partitioned to mm -hmm. apply these kind of things. Like I think for the first one, that is the climate change simulation that should have problem with image rendering or the. Questions? Yeah. Done uh, again at this GPU mixer. They try to get the uh, from the papers, from the uh, Harvard uh, just descriptions, and they couldn't find any details about it. And they measured it that this is a good idea to think that one arithmetic operation is equal to one casting operation. On CPUs, this, this information is, is available, not oh, really on yeah. GPUs. Yeah, so this work was only on GPUs. On CPUs, we didn't try to. <laughs> So would that be that one arithmetic is the same as uh, cast? Would that be two for all kinds of arithmetic operations? For example, divisions. I think they are more expensive. Mm. Yeah. So. Yeah, uh, we didn't test it yet. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah, good idea to check on that also. Okay, if there's nothing left, it's time for coffee and let's thank Ali for his